Morning. morning. Welcome. Good to see everybody here this morning. It's a rainy morning, but uh, glad to see everyone here. Hope you had a good week. Uh, I'm trying to think. Oh, and also, you know, um, keep Josie in prayer. She's having a surgery tomorrow morning, Tracy said. So, uh, 7 a.m. Children's Hospital. So make sure you keep her in prayer. She uh, <clears throat> has that done, but um, we'll make sure we're, we're doing that. Uh, let's see. Hopefully you all had a good week. Nothing too new and exciting I can say per se for, for me. Just kind of the same usual. You know, we had the Steelers, well, the NFL draft. If you're an NFL fan at all, watch any football. Steelers got Kenny Pickett, right? New quarterback. We'll see how that uh, that goes, you know, um, I don't know. I don't, didn't follow too much college football, but they say he's a you know, pretty, pretty good prospect. Uh, hopefully, maybe we'll uh, have a new franchise quarterback. That's about, about all. I'm not sure how many uh, NFL fans there are, but anywho. What's that? Penguins playoffs on Tuesday, you said? All right, well, if you're a Penguins fan, make sure you mark that on your calendar as well. I haven't, I haven't caught too many games this year, um, but I'll try to watch the playoffs some for sure. Uh, we'll see how they do, but uh, you know, as Crosby and them gets older, you know, I don't know. You need to make sure we're rebuilding some teams for for Terry, so we can have a good team to watch. Um, but anyway, uh, we're pressing forward this week. Last week we took a break from our usual stuff, and we did just a kind of a topical message. Uh, this week we're back on track, being in First Thessalonians, right? And so that's what we're going to be in uh, this morning as we continue on almost to the end of the Bible, and uh, uh, we'll accomplish our goal here shortly, working all the way through it. Um, First Thessalonians, today's message, uh, it's, you know, it's a little different in terms of how we're going to address this book. Basically, it's like pretty simple. We're just going to work through it, read some stuff, and just talk about, you know, what is Paul's intention, Paul's mindset as we go through. That way you can better understand it when you read it. We're not going to delve too much into it. It's just kind of a, a fly-by skim of the whole book. So, again, just kind of kicking off as usual, the author, of course, we have the Apostle Paul writing First Thessalonians. Uh, probably along with Silas and Timothy, we see this, he outlines this in the book, about approximately 50 AD as the writing. And then why did Paul write this book? Well, two main issues. Um, one, people were having some misunderstandings about when Jesus was going to return. And secondly, there were some uh, letters about uh, some morality and things like that in terms of instructing to live holy, moral, Christian, um, Christ follower lives. These are the two main themes that you see here when you read this. Uh, which is, you know, probably raises some people's ears and questions because it shows very early on people too had questions about Jesus returning. You know, when's it going to happen? How's it going to happen? Um, all that kind of stuff, which we'll skim over here in in a little bit. Um, Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica, which is this area, and the church in this area actually started because of a, a violent upheaval, actually, and so. Uh, people started some rumors about Paul, saying, hey, Paul and these Christians are trying to cause some problems. Let's kick this guy out of here. And it actually worked. Paul was only there on his first trip about about three weeks. Um, but then uh, that's when the church kind of is, you know, takes root. And which is, you actually see this many places when, when persecution happens, it tends to drive the growth of the church. We actually see this in China currently, you know, the persecuted Christians there. It's one of the fastest growing, you know, uh, faiths really um, in this, you know, even though they face jail time, death, things like that, depending on how now their official policies say, no, we tolerate that stuff. But when you actually talk to people on the ground, they face persecution. But nevertheless, that is kind of what is going on here um, what, what's going on. Uh, this book, too, is different than the books that precede it, which is going to make today's sermon a little bit different, because there's not a lot of focus, per se, on theology. Now, there is, of course, there's theology in here, but it's not very theological heavy. Uh, if, when you read this book, you'll, you'll see some points, of course, that are theological, but um, you'll really notice Paul's relationship with this church. You'll see him talking like a concerned parent, uh, showing the, the, the concern and the gratitude and the thanksgiving and all of that uh, for this. If you would ask Paul, who, what, was your, what was your favorite church or what was the church that you were most concerned about? Paul would probably respond, you know, similar like a parent. Uh, he would say, well, my most concern would be the church that has the most problems and uh, that is sick until it is well. Or, which church do you miss the most? Well, probably you'd say the church I've been away from the longest until I'm reconciled with that church. Uh, and so you see Paul operating very much with this mindset when you, when you read this, and, and he's thanking them continually for that. Uh, and so he's going to write some things, you know, so pay attention to the themes, pay attention to his attitude towards the Thessalonians, but it's really important that we, that we see, um, you know, what's going on here. And again, two main 
two main things Paul is going to address is, um, one, addressing the concern the Thessalonians had about Jesus returning, and then two, moral uh, living for, for Christians. These are the two main themes that you're going to see here. Uh, and we'll get a little, little bit into some of this here uh, shortly anyways. Uh, many people think this is Paul's earliest writing, some, or one of the, uh, Paul's earliest writings when he's re- writing these books. Uh, and so when you see this, if you had to pick a theme, I guess, for First Thessalonians, you could say this is about uh, the gathering of the church, or rather it's centered on the return of Jesus, or the day of Christ, as you might say. Uh, which also is interesting, too, is that Paul, very early on, found it important to tell these Christians about the return of Jesus. Think about it. I mean, he's only, he was only there, what, three weeks before he was kicked out? Uh, and they already have questions about the return of Jesus. So that should tell us, like, the return of Jesus was very important for Paul, right? P- very important for his preaching, which we have to think about as Christians. How often do we think about the return of Christ, you know, um, the return of Jesus? We might think about it a little bit, but they were very much focused on it. They were very much had a lot of questions on this. Also, I think, too, it shows us that it didn't, doesn't take, well, here anyways, it didn't take a long time to start the church. You know, like nowadays, um, you, people want to start a church plant, they have all kind of formulas for it, right? You go into an area, you do demographic studies of what people might be interested in or looking at. You look at the demographics, you look at, look at the statistics, you look at the population area. <laughs> like Paul didn't do any of that. Paul just went into an area, preached the Word of God, unleashed it, and people received it, and the church was started, which is Kind of a fascinating thing that we see uh, nowadays. Many churches, church plants, you know, take kind of a more of a, maybe a business approach of starting a church. But you know, I get it. You know, in terms of what they're trying to do. But Paul didn't really have that that model. So in this here, Paul is doing this. Then some troublemakers come up and say, "Hey, this guy is causing problems." Uh, I think if you go to the book of Acts, it says he's trying to turn this area or world upside down you know, on its head. It was just because God's a troublemaker. And then he gets kicked out. It works. Uh, but, I mean, there's so many verses here. I won't go through them because, you know, um, there's a lot of them. But after he's forced to leave and he's writing these letters, uh, there's a lot of focus on the return of Jesus. I'll just read. It's not on the screen. I'll just read a few. Uh, in 2.19, he says, For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of the Lord Jesus when he comes is not is it not you? And then 3.13, again, not up there. He says, May he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all of his holy ones. 5.23, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, continually, Paul finds it very important to continually mention the return of Christ. You know, let's not... Forget that as Christians. It was very much a center. So if you come across a church that doesn't really mention the coming of Jesus or, or anything like that, uh, red flag, you know, should be a little bit up there because it was very important for the early Christians uh, for Jesus um, and nevertheless. Okay, so that's some of the, the background stuff you need to know going into it. We'll skim through it. Uh, some of these titles that we're going to do in terms of um, chapters and themes, it, there's a little bit of a tweaking and adjusting because there's a lot of different themes or topics in these chapters, but it helps you at least get a general idea of maybe what some of the theme Paul was trying to hit upon in the in these chapters. Uh, and so he's going to kick off with thanksgiving uh, and, and faith for the Thessalonians. And in chapter 1, the theme would be the transmission of faith. So the transmission of faith. Let's read uh, Thess- 1 Thessalonians 1. We'll go 1 through 10. Uh, Paul, Silas, and Timothy... To the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that He has chosen you because Our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. 
You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols, to serving the living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. There's a lot of stuff there, but I mean, first of all, you notice Paul's gratitude and prayer for them, so you see his heart and love. You always see that, that underpinning thing of love. But then, uh, you know, notice, notice kind of the, the three tenses of the Christian faith in some of these things. So, past tense, you turn from God and worthless idols, right? Present tense, to serve the living and true God. And then future tense, to wait for the sun from heaven. That's an interesting thing that you see, right? Past, present, and future, which shows this is... The Christian life is dynamic, you know, it's, it's not something that you did once, one time, long ago, you know what I mean? Uh, some people, you know, treat Christianity um, like, a, like a flu shot, you know, oh, oh yeah, I did that, I did that, you know, I, I got baptized, I believed, but here you see there's this dynamic as you're living the Christian life as the disciple of Jesus, like, it, it kind of is the old theology or framework was, um, I, I was saved, I am saved, you know, I'm being saved, I, I will be saved, the kind of a thing, right? So, I was saved, you know, the, the baptism, the trusting what Christ has done. Um, I am being saved, meaning the sanctification as God is continually working in your life to transform you more and more in the image of Christ. And I will be saved, looking to the future tense of when God is going to redeem all of creation, including us, and we get the new glorified and resurrected bodies. So important to see that, right? It's a, it's a living, dynamic thing. It's not just, oh yeah, I did that one time, right? And so Paul, it's great to see here that even that, that framework in terms of what it means to live the Christian faith, um, the past, the present, and the future kind of a, kind of a thing, right? And then he, he looks at all of these things, um, and he talks about looking towards the future, right? This dimensional thing. And then go on. Uh, we're going to see here actually this framework of the transmission of faith. So the gospel comes to you, but then it goes through you as well. Go to 5a2. Look, it says, Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. That's really interesting is, um, so the gospel message, it's, the model seems to be, okay, the gospel comes to you, you receive it, but then it needs to flow through you and, and to people, right? And so here, he gives models of, it wasn't just words, man, but people were experiencing the power of God, you know, the, the signs and wonders they were experiencing, the, the Holy Spirit power working in their lives, and this is the thing I think that many sometimes we miss is, you know, this is when Christianity can become and should become exciting and, and, and um, power-filled, right? When you're just going through life, you've you received the gospel, and now you're walking through life and saying, okay, God, I'm just a vessel. How do you want to use me to reach the world? You know, how do you want to use me to, on a daily basis, God, who do you want me to talk to? God, who do you want me to bless? God, who do you want me to serve? God, what do you want me to do? And so that's when you're really tuned in to just listening to that still small voice daily and say, okay, God, what do you have for me? You know, and I think that's where many times we miss it because we're not doing that. You know, we're just going about our daily life, living it kind of like, well, you know, God is up there and he leaves us down here to kind of do our own thing and run the show. But that's not the model of the Christian faith. The model is Holy Spirit led and filled people going around as God leads and directs and doing kingdom stuff. And I think that's what we see here. So as Christians, don't forget that model. The gospel comes to you, but then it's to flow through you, right? And to reach people and to touch people. And God is doing amazing things through people. But as I've said many times is, are you attentive to it? And are you making yourself available and willing to do that, right? If you're not, if you're just kind of walking through life blindly and focused on your own stuff and never even considering, God, what do you want me to do? Then you're, you're going to have a hard time you know, doing those things. But, so that's chapter 1. 
the transmission of faith. So just as you read that on your own, kind of keep that in mind. Um, past, present, future kind of tense of the Christian walk, and then the gospel comes to you and then through you. Now we're going to see Paul's ministry in Thessalonica. Uh, chapter 2, you could say, is the demonstration of love. We'll see um, this whole kind of model here. So go to 1 Thessalonians 2. We'll go 3 through 7. For the appeal we make does not spring out from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God, who tests our hearts. We know we never use flattery, nor we did put a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even Though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. And uh, as we see this, this model here, uh, again, Paul was addressing accusations. People were accusing them of impure motives or trickery or greed or, or whatever it might be. And um, we know that Paul had a tent-making ministry as well to help support his ministry so he didn't have to be a burden to some of the churches. And, uh, and so they couldn't you know, put that on him. Uh, but this, this kind of, um, he had authority, but he wasn't like a dictator, you know what I mean? So he, he had the authority to do it, but he wasn't authoritative in a sense. He wasn't just trying to be like a tyrant or, or whatever it might be. Uh, he often likens himself to um, both a young mother or, or a mother taking care of children, or some places like a father taking care of a child. So you see this, this painting of Paul being like a parent to the church. And, and then go on to... Verses 8 through 12. So we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you in his kingdom and glory." Again, that model of nurturing. And again, this framework of of Paul is, you know what? Uh, Not living to please people. Not living to get praise from people. Living to please God. Living to honor God. You know, how much more would we be um, urged or or to do that, you know? You know what? We're not live to please people or to get praise from people. Just, am I pleasing God? Am I honoring God with my life of how I'm using God? And stewarding everything God has given me, my, my, my time, my energy, my resources, all of that. And, and so for Paul, it's about you know, it's being authentic, you know, not trying to, to kowtow to what people want and to what people expect and, and uh, what people think that should be done. So listen, we're just trying to honor God and preach the gospel, right? Live God. He says, live lives um, worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And so I think that's just, you know, uh, great stuff to think about for sure. Uh, now, uh, we're, Paul's going to address Timothy's encouraging report. So remember, he sends Timothy. Timothy sends back an encouraging report. And Paul is going to be thankful for the encouraging report. But he's also not going to ignore some of the concerns he has as well. Uh, but we see him doing this. And now, if he had to pick a theme for Chapter 3, I guess you would do exhortation to godliness. This is where Paul is going to exhort them to live lives that are actually honoring God, that are um, pleasing to God. Uh, so he, he kind of gets direct with him a little bit here, or gets very direct with him. So go to chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. For now we really live, since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Um, And again, Paul is saying, yeah, great, you're making some progress and thankful for that. But also, what is lacking in your faith? Sometimes we miss that. You know, what is lacking in our faith? Sometimes if you think you've arrived or made it or, or can't learn anything or can't grow in your life, you're not keeping your ears open. You know, what is lacking in our faith? Uh, and that's something you can only really tell when you're um, being honest with yourself, when you're asking God to reveal things to you. Or maybe even if you have a good brother or sister in Christ that 
you know in love, an accountability partner will be honest with you, right, in terms of, you know, hey, you know, I, I, th I see you're struggling in this area, and you can take that constructive criticism, not be offended, and not be outraged, and, and whatever it might be. Um, but, you know, I, I, when you see this kind of stuff here, um, man, like, Paul... This, this stuff really filled Paul with joy. Essentially, it's this, is Paul in ministry, or just, you know, and when, you, when you see and you're working in ministry and you're, and you're trying to uh, help people grow in the faith, when you see people actually living it out, that keeps you going. That, that excites you. That's like, that's a good feeling, you know what I mean? But when, when you're trying to, even as a pastor, you know, preach the gospel and help people grow spiritually and grow closer to God, and then you see or experience people act unchristlike, or you, you know, have just notice things um, uh, in the world we live in, it can be very discouraging. It's like, people not even listen, do they not even care? And, and not, not a judging type thing, but more as, like, as Paul was, like a parent, concerned for them, wanting them to grow. You know, we even see this in, um, uh, similar to, uh, I think it's uh, 3 John verse 4, maybe I think it is, uh, but it's, it's that excites you. When you're ministering, people are growing and flourishing in their faith, they're taking their faith seriously. It, it, it really comes to be about, um, they're hungry for it, right? Go to uh, verse 12 to 13. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all of his holy ones. And so again, you see that theme of, of love increasing, right? Living holy lives, and also the anticipation that Christ is coming back again. You know, you can't just forget that. Like, he, he will return again. And they have this in their mind as well, um, for sure. Um, now on to chapter, there's only five chapters too, by the way, so it's not a huge book, just in case you weren't sure. Chapter four, I guess you could see it's living to please God. That's a theme, living to honor God, and also focus on uh, the coming of, of Jesus Christ. So go to four, verse one, says this. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we asked you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of our Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. We'll stop right there a second. And if you ever wonder what God's will for your life is, well, start with the places where it tells you, you know. It's God's will that you be sanctified, being transformed more and more in the image of Christ, right? That's the whole theme of, of more of, more of, more of God, less of myself. That's the theme of dying to self for the sake of Christ, right? That's the idea of throwing off everything that so easily entangles you as you run the race for which was set before you, right? As you press on towards the goal, um, that was made before you, right? The kingdom and living these lives. And then, Paul gets a little more specific and tells them how to do that, right? He says that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in the passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gave you his Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and it's just some stuff, right? So, all right, we're sanctified. We're, you know, being transformed more in the image of Christ. There's some specific, specific things you can do. Um, Interesting, Paul mentioned some of these specific things, probably because in that area, as you may or may not already know from previous conversations, that there was a lot of um, pagan temple worship, and a lot of times involved with that was um, sensual practices that people would engage in to worship these false gods. And so Paul was like, hey, you know, don't, don't, don't be part of that kind of stuff and, and other matters. And so how you live your life matters, how you control yourself matters, and, and the same... You know, the very last part, I think, strikes true can be applied to many of God's um, laws or commands or, or, again, not to be arbitrary, but to save you, to, to know these things that would destroy you and are counterproductive and, and not for what you were, were designed, but um, for your protection, basically. But then he says, you're not rejecting, you know, man, but you're rejecting God. And many people do that. They just, 
they're like, oh, I'm not going to, I don't care what God says about something. You know, maybe society says this or culture says this isn't okay. So, okay, I mean, that's fine. I mean, you can, you can believe that and you can follow that, but you can't control the consequences, not only in this life, many times that come from deviating from that, but also eternally the consequences is from rejecting God um, and trying to be Lord of your life because that is the age-old sin, right? All the way back to the garden is God says this, I'm going to do this instead because I know better um, and trying to be Lord of your own life. But so we, we see this here. Uh, I think, again, the key to spiritual growth, I think, really comes down to the heart. How do you, res- even Jesus says, on how do you receive? How do you hear? You know, you could tell people this, and some people, two people this, one, some one person will hear it, accept it, and live it. Um, other people will reject it and don't live it. Same, same words, two different people, two different results. And again, what's the difference? The heart of the person, right? How you receive God's word. Are, are you hard-hearted? Are you like, ah, I've heard that before, ah, you know, or, oh, yes, God, you're speaking to me and I, I need to apply this to my life because, you know, he loves me, he knows what's best for me, and I know, I feel the conviction, I need to make some adjustments in my life. Are you hard-hearted? What kind of soil do you have? Remember the old message of the soil, right? The, the good soil, the rocky soil, the thorny soil, all of that, it, it comes down to this. How are you hearing the word? You know, because... You can come here, and if, if you're hearing the word, it's like, ah, man, that's not for me. I don't want to hear it, or it doesn't sound, it's not, it's not entertaining to me. That, that's the biggest thing, I think, for our culture, right? We want to be entertained. We, we really do. You know, I try to make things uh, whatever as I can, but I used to do it more so. Now I'd probably do it less because I'm more concerned about actually just teaching the word and having equipping people than, you know, firing you up or giving you an entertaining, funny story or whatever. There's a little bit of that in there. But that, that's what it was for Paul. It's like, um, it's not about that, you know? I, in America, it's like, okay, we come to church, and you have, okay, set your watch, pastor, you have half an hour, 45 minutes, maybe. You better drop something really good in there because I got things to do, you know? You better make me laugh and cry and smile and, and keep my attention. Um, but that, that's a cultural thing, you know? You, you, I listened to a sermon um, from Skip Heitzig, who did, did a good outline on this, some of which we're following. Um, and he mentioned India, which I found interesting, because I've too, to you, mentioned India. And he talked about going to India and preaching, and because and the, and the, my, my previous pastor was originally from India. And he talked about going to India, and he said, but I went there, I asked the pastor, you know, how long is your typical service? And he's like, about four hours or so. And the guy, he's like, what? He's like, yeah, yeah. He's like, many people will walk long distances to come to church, and so you, you, know, you want to give them their, their, their time's worth. And so he, he's like, yeah, we'll preach for a few hours, you know, take a break, we'll hang out, and then preach again. And he's like, people are hungry for it. You know, they're not sitting there checking their watches and trying to criticize and whatever. They just want to hear God's word and be fed. Uh, and that's a big difference, I think, many times for some people who just want to be entertained in a little time window and then go off and do your own thing. But it's about the person's heart. Are you hungry for God's truth and word? Or do you just want to be entertained and hear things already apply with what you believe and want? But uh, that is the theme that we see here. Now go on to verse 9. Now, about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family through Macedonia. We urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. And that's some good stuff right there. I mean, like, like he's just, you know, how you live your life. He's saying, hey, uh, there's so much in there. Like, for obviously the love, like make sure you're increasing loving and, and doing this. But make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, mind your own business, and work with your hands just as we told you. Why? So that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and that you will, will not be dependent on anybody. That's, that's great. I mean, like, so much. Simplistic, right? I mean, okay. Are you are 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 you just a, a simplistic, quiet life, minding your business, actually working for a living, earning earn, earning your wages, right? That we told you why. Respect from outsiders, not dependent on anybody. And so, two things like as outsiders look at you as a Christian, as the church, do, would they respect you? 
But if you're living a life that is not loving, that is hate-filled, that is arrogant, that is loud mouth, that is you fill in the blank, and they wouldn't, and they don't respect you, that's a problem, you know. Um, we live in a culture now. It's like I don't care. I'm just gonna, you know, I don't whatever. But Paul says no. You should care. You should want people to respect you. Don't do things and live a life that would cause outsiders to not respect you. You know, because uh, that we see that like oh, there's another Christian, just you know, um, hypocrite, a liar, a loud mouth. Uh, you 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 fill in the blank. Just Paul says, listen, just don't worry so much about everyone else's life. You live your life to honor God. Live it honorably. Don't do anything that people can come against you and say you did X, Y, and Z, and, and you're not living an honorably respectful life. Right? Work for a living, and that way you're not dependent on anybody as well. Um, that's a key thing. I think sometimes we overcomplicate it. We're so worried about everybody else that, you know what? I'm, and we, we fill our mind with the news and the media where we're so unhappy. And you know what? Let's just live our lives in a way that is honorable, a quiet life, minding our business, you know, uh, earning our wages. Um, and this is, this is in part Paul to this too, I'll just spoiler alert, because some people were quitting their jobs and not working, thinking that Jesus was coming back like right then and there. And that's why Paul had to address it later on, saying, listen, if you don't, if you don't work, you don't eat. You know? And so make sure you uh, work and supply for yourself and your family. Don't try to take advantage of the system, Paul would essentially be, be saying. Um, but nevertheless, there's a lot in there, but I'll, I'll just leave it at that. And now, real quickly, Paul is going to talk about um, death and resurrection because this is a big theme here. People were concerned about what was going on to happen when Jesus returned. So, verse 13, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with, the, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And so instruction for the end times, essentially, that we we'll see here about um, when Christ comes again for his bride, the church. And um, then there's the second coming of Jesus, which is when Jesus you know, returns with his church. I'm not going to say too much on here. I'll just say a couple things. Um, obviously, the resurrection is key. Look at, do not be uninformed by those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Like, death is not final. Death does not win in the end. So, for Christians, you can have encouragement, a hope that goes beyond, that, that there's a resurrection to come, that there's another life after this, right? Um, not only that, but we'll get new resurrected glorified bodies. So it's not just you go to be a ghost and play a harp somewhere. No, no. Um, you, you will get a new glorified resurrected body. When he says being asleep here, that's just an ancient way of saying they've died. You know, people, different, you know, there's different theologies and things around this word about people just still sleeping in the graves and things like that. Um, but when they say asleep, it's people who have died. That's what they say. Um, the concern they had was, hey, Paul, well, what about the people that already died? Are they going to miss out on the resurrection? That was the question they were having, essentially. And he said, no, no, don't, don't worry about that. When Christ returns, they will be raised first, right? They'll be raised first, and then we also too. Um, and so that's the question behind all of this. Uh, now, I will say this, that this is where some of the, the rapture theology comes from. And I'm not going to try to simplify it. We don't have time for that. But I will just say there's, there's good, um, compelling arguments for different ways this can be interpreted in terms of, quote-unquote, the rapture, right? Um, you have the well-known Left Behind series that's very popular with the movies and things, about people getting snatched out and disappearing and things. Uh, my personal opinion, that, it pro that is not really probably theological accurate. There are some well-known scholars that do think that is how it will play out. Uh, I, I don't think that is the intent of, of this passage at all. Mm, there's a lot of, we don't have time for it. 
but you don't this not you don't get bogged down by the details of how this is going to play out. We can maybe have a sermon on it before. I think we haven't had it before. But just know this. This is about Christ returning for his church, his people. How exactly this plays out, there's different topics and theologies behind this in terms of how you interpret this verse. Is he talking literally? Is he, is he addressing more of like a, uh, a Daniel chapter 7 kind of prophecy? regarding the, the, the Messiah, when he is glorified, ascending on the clouds before God, being vindicated, a lot of different things. You can look at some N.T. Wright for some theology on rapture stuff. Um, ben Witherington has some very interesting thoughts that don't, don't um, align with maybe what many Christians just, they just have this view of, well, you get sucked into the clouds, out, you're good, you're gone, and that's it. Me personally, I'm not so sure it's that simple in terms of why this was created, but we don't have time for it. Just know that's what's going on, that Christ is returning. Don't worry, those who have already fallen asleep or died, they will not miss out on the resurrection, and um, we'll leave it at that for now. Um, and then lastly, real quick, uh, chapter 5, the coming of the Lord, and final instruction. Go to five one. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should um, surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness, so then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober." Interesting phrasing and being awake and, and sober. Um, nobody expects a thief, you know what I mean? Like if, if you expect a thief, then you're gonna be you're gonna be ready here. You'll be prepared. Uh, and so, like a thief for unbelievers, but believers should be anticipating the coming of Christ. Now he's saying dates and times, and that's not gonna get into that. So when you see people start setting dates and times, your flag should go up right away and say this person's a crackpot most likely, you know, because people have done this forever and they're always wrong and they've always been wrong and then they recalculate and adjust and say, oh, no, this is the date and they're wrong again. And it just gives Christians bad names because it's like, oh, look at this, you know, doomsday prophet of trying to set dates and times. So be alert on that um, spectrum. And so unbelievers like, ah, if things are good and things are, you know, kind of remind you like the day of Noah, right? When people are like, drink, eat, drink, and be merry, and all of that, and then boom, the flood happens. Um, but he's saying, Christians, uh, that maybe you don't know the date and time, but you can have a feeling or a sign or, or, or see that things are um, signs of the age, as, as uh, the Bible might put it. So be alert, anticipate it, waiting for it. But don't be setting dates and times, and don't be surprised either, because it's going to surprise a lot of people, right? That's the thing here. And then go on to verse 7. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. So as you are waiting and watching and living lives to please God and loving God and loving others, build each other up, right? Encourage one another. Are you doing this to fellow believers? You shouldn't be tearing them down and talking bad about them and uh, all that kind of stuff. You should be encouraging them, building them up. Sadly, many Christians, they criticize and tear down. Foolish. But nevertheless, um, be anticipatory, right? Don't forget about the, the coming of Jesus. Now, don't, don't get so obsessed with it either. Or some people, they quit working and just, oh, he's going to come back any, any second now. Um, like, keep alert, keep a watch. Um, but also, the anticipation. Like, do you want that to happen? Like, people... You know, like the old, the old, um, the phrase, you know, Maranatha, which means come Lord Jesus. Like, man, just waiting for Jesus to come back. Excited for Jesus to come back. Can't wait. Uh, you know, when you're living in a culture and a world where you're heavily oppressed and persecuted and suffering, man, you want that salvation to come. If you are um, lazy or asleep or, uh, I don't know how, how to put it, but, 
um, just spirit, just comfortable, you know, ah, whatever, you know what I mean? You know, you're just, you're, your belly's full, you know, your belly's full, you're just, it's fine. Then maybe you're not so urgent for that to happen. But when you are desperate for a savior, when you're experiencing true pain and oppression and persecution, true hunger, like many people do in the world today, you know, physically and all the awful things that sometimes we as Christians put our head in the sand about what's going on around the world. Boy, you want Christ to come back desperately because you're, you're suffering um, in ways you can't even imagine. And so always keep that. Say, Lord, man, can wait for that day when Jesus comes and sets his world right, right? Puts a final ending to suffering, disease, death, um, and we can all live that glorified, perfect, perfected life with him. And so never minimize the second coming of Jesus and his return. We should be anticipating it and longing for him to come and set this messed up world right if you are really have your mindset and kingdom mindset perspective on track. So that is uh, 1 Thessalonians um, in a nutshell. Hopefully now you're better equipped to read through it and understand what is going on. We'll delve into 2 Thessalonians next week. Um, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the stand, everybody here. God, as we read your word, help it. Lord, we just pray through your spirit that you speak to us. Speak to our heart. Let us receive it with good soil that uh, you may, the seed's been sown. Let it, you water it, you nurture it. Help it to grow in our lives, Father, that it will produce a crop hundredfold if we are hearing it and receive it with the right heart and mind and attitude. God, help us to read this and see what it means actually to number one, to live a Christian life, right? Walking in love and holiness, um, living quiet lives and, and working and, and minding our business, Father, just to glorify and honor you, number one priority there in doing kingdom stuff. And God, help us never stop looking forward, anticipating, desiring, the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, Father, to set this world right, to put an end to the evil and pain and suffering that has been going on for so long. Help us to long for that, Father, and to be ready for it, anticipate for it. But until that time comes, Lord, we have a job to do, and let us press forward and continually, continually do that. God, guide us, lead us. We thank you and praise you in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen.